Okay. Good morning, everyone. Today in our training program for FRCS Part Two Viva Exams, uh, we are continuing with our Viva sessions. Anish, floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. So today we will discuss the station, the bladder dysfunction, and the gynecological aspects. We have got a trainee who has agreed to record this session which is very useful for revision and uh, for learning uh, the most important aspects of this station. Uh, so we will st straight away start with the uh, scenario. So you have a 32 year old gentleman who previously had a T10 spinal cord injury following a fall seven months ago. He was on catheter initially, now doing intermittent self catheterization. His main complaint is incontinence in spite of doing, doing CIC four times per day. Uh, okay. How are you going to proceed? So I will see this uh, patient in my clinic. Uh, on arrival, he will have a, a urine uh, dipstick and uh, then I will take from the patient uh, focus uh, history about uh, the time of the initial uh, injury, the progress of injury, um, progress of his symptoms over time. I will ask about his um, uh, voiding and storage urinary uh, symptoms, uh, ask about any incontinence, uh, whether it is um, urge incontinence or stress incontinence. I will ask about any red flag symptoms like hematuria or recurrent UTI, um, nighttime bedwetting. I will ask also about any uh, constipation uh, as well. I'll ask about his uh, baseline sexual function and then I will uh, ask about the medical history, any medical problem and the use of any medication, any previous surgery. I'll ask about his uh, diet and fluid intake. Uh, also I'll ask about uh, the frequency of how much he is doing self-intermittent catheterization, uh, the size of catheter, whether he has measured uh, how much still in the bladder after he used uh, the catheter, whether he is using any anticholinergic medication or other medication um, at the moment, and the impact of the uh, uh, leak in his uh, social and sexual life. And then I will proceed to uh, examination of the patient I'll examine him general examination and also I will examine uh, mainly the abdomen looking for only descended uh, bladder. I'll examine uh, the genitalia and uh, testis uh, and I will perform also a focused neurological examination. Uh, I will do urine dipstick uh, for the patient and I will ask him to fill uh, the IPSS uh, form and uh, bladder diary, three day bladder diary, and uh, I will perform fluorite and uh, post void bladder scan. Okay. Uh, what is the level of the termination of spinal cord? Usually, the uh, spinal cord will uh, terminate at the level of uh, um, L2. L3. Okay. And uh, what type of injury uh, would you describe this in the classification of the um, cord lesions? So this is uh, recorded as upper motor neural lesion since it is uh, above the um, sacral uh, spinal cord center which is S2, 3, S4. Um, so it's regarded as upper motor neural lesion and this patient expected uh, to have a, a neuropathic detrusal um, overactivity uh, and it's expected that the sphincter will be, uh, uh, it's expected that he will not have a DSD. Okay. Uh, what other investigations do you want to do for him? For any patient with uh, neuropathic blood, I want also to check the blood, checking for kidney function, full blood count, and inflammatory marker. And I will ask whether any urodynamic has been done recently or not. If there is no urodynamic for the last two to three years, then I will um, arrange for this patient to have a, a video urodynamic. Uh, if the patient has any suggestive symptoms of um, complication like um, immature recurrent UTI deterioration renal function, then I will arrange for uh, imaging as well. Okay. So, 
I'm going to share the screen for you. Can you describe this? Can you see that? Yeah. Can so this, this is a, a video Eurodynamic. Just let me show you. see, and there is the cycle of terminal and the trusel. And this is a filling phase of a video aerodynamic, uh, which uh, showed uh, some uh, the trusel overactivity toward uh, the end of the filling phase. Um, I can't see if there is any leak associated with it. Uh, the top bar is EMG which reflects sphincter activity and there is an increase in the sphincter activity at the time of the detrusal over activity as well. Mm -hmm. And what about the fluoroscopy image? The fluoroscopy image showed some uh, open bladder neck and there is some shadow behind the bladder. It doesn't look like a reflux. Mm -hmm. It looks like possibly like elongated bladder or a possible diverticulum. Okay. Uh, uh, what is your diagnosis in this one? Uh, neuropathic detrusal overactivity. Okay. So I'm going to uh, stop the sharing now. And uh, ha have you seen any peculiarity in the uh, PDET uh, waveform during the voiding phase? Uh, what I've seen is that there is some uh, reduced compliance and there is the trusal overactivity okay. in the trusal patient. How are you going to manage this patient? So this patient, in spite of doing the self-intermittent catheterization, he still have um, some leak of urine, which is expected with the trusal overactivity. Mm -hmm. So um, I will start uh, by um, conservative management. Uh, um, which include uh, avoid any, any substance which is irritating the bladder in food or drink. I will ask the patient also to do a uh, bladder training, which may help. And uh, in this patient, I will not expect that this conservative measure will help. So I will go to prescribe uh, anticholinergic medication for him. I will make sure that there is no contraindication to the anticholinergic medication. I will explain the possible side effect. Uh, and then I will start him on uh, anticholinergic medication. Okay. Uh, what about uh, beta-3 receptor agonist? Uh, we can use beta-3 agonist, but according to the NICE guideline, we need to start first with the um, anticholinergic medication. If there is lack of effect or contraindication, then we can prescribe uh, Mirabigran. Okay. Any other medications for the treatment of this one? Uh, usually, I will start with anticholinergic first. Uh, if it is not working, uh, then I can combine the anticholinergic with mirabigron or try <coughs> mirabigron alone. If both are, are not working, then we will go ahead to the invasive option mm -hmm. uh, in the form of intravasacral botox injection. Okay. What is the mechanism of action of botox? So, uh, Botox is a botulinum toxin. It has uh, two chains, uh, the heavy chain and the light chain. Uh, the heavy uh, chain will uh, help in the endocytosis, which is an uh, introduction of the medication into the cells. And then the light chain uh, will act uh, to uh, uh, break the SNAP protein. By this, it will prevent the release of uh, acetylcholine from the um, uh, neural synapse and the, by this it will prevent the contraction. Okay. Uh, how do you count, uh, wh what's the evidence of uh, botulinum toxin injection in neurogenic detrusor act or activity? Uh, I'm aware of the Embarker study uh, which showed a good evidence and effect of uh, intravasacral botox injection. Okay. Uh, okay. How, how, how would you give botox in your practice? So first, I want to counsel the patient about the uh, breast can benefit alternative and I will support my uh, counseling with the bounce leaflet. The patient need to understand the low possibility of uh, possible urinary, uh, urinary retention. Therefore, the patient should accept and be uh, confident in doing self-intermittent catheterization 
uh, before doing the buttox, I will exclude um, any infection as well, urinary infection. Uh, and then usually it is done under local anesthesia uh, with a flexible cystoscopy. Uh, we start usually with uh, 100 international unit uh, injected over 20 sites. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will inform the patient also that the effect will Botox may wear off after six to nine months and he may need to have a repeat injection. Okay, what about antibiotics? I will give a prophylactic antibiotic, but I will avoid gentamicin because it interferes with the uh, neuromuscular junction. Okay. Uh, if the Botox is not working, what are the other options generally? In this patient, since he's a, a neuropath, um, I will try first the 100 unit, and then if it's not working, I can try the 200 unit mm -hmm. uh, as well. If it is still not working, um, then we will go to the next step, which is uh, uh, either cycle neuromodulation or consideration of um, augmentation cystoplasty. However, this needs to be discussed in a um, regional MDT. Okay. Uh, is this patient at risk of developing autonomic dysreflexia? No, unlikely, because usually the um, level of uh, autonomic dysreflexia in patient more than T6 infection, uh, T6 injury. Okay, what is the definition of autonomic dysreflexia? So, autonomic dysreflexia is uh, um, uh, over discharge of uh, sympathetic output uh, above the level of the injury, which will cause uh, headache, uh, flushing, uh, hypertension, um, uh, tachycardia um, as well. And there is a vasospasm in the area below uh, the level of the injury. It is a life-threatening uh, condition and the clinician need to be aware uh, before performing any procedure like cystoscopy or urodynamic to the patient. Um, patient, we need to ask a patient about any history of previous episode of autonomic dysreflexia. Make sure that the urine is uh, clear of any infection, the rectum is not uh, loaded, and then we can start the procedure like cystoscopy or urodynamic in, in an environment where uh, resuscitation equipment and expertise are available. And if the patient developed any symptoms of autonomic dysreflex, which will really start with uh, some headache, uh, nausea, uh, and the flushing, then we need to stop the procedure immediately, empty the bladder, um, uh, keep the patient on the syndic pot, uh, position, loosen his uh, clothes, and then we treat him with uh, sublingual nifedipine or uh, uh, glyceride glycerol nitrate um, spray. I may need uh, to ask the help of my medical colleague as well. Um, so this is the, about the autonomic dysreflexia. Okay, so that's time now. So uh, we'll go to the next scenario. Just to add a feedback uh, for the past scenario, okay, we'll um, yeah. don't be very rush in advising sacral neuromodulation for neurogenic bladder. Mm -hmm. The evidence is very poor and also sometimes it won't work because yeah. already the uh, neuronal discontinuity and uh, incoherent. So you can't depend on a jeopardized neurology system to do a sacral neural modulation and try to utilize the same injured system to give you a good outcome. Um, so you have traveled in a very general manner, like uh, how uh, overactive bladder will pathway. So Botox is okay because the bladder is uh, not injured. But uh, once you reach the second neural modulation, you need to be very careful. Peripheral percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation is okay because sometimes tibial nerve will be intact and that may be having some effect. But the evidence for both P10 and second neural modulation is very poor. And uh, in fact, uh, some examiners we even go to say you should not do second neural modulation in a neurogenic bladder patient. Yes. Yeah, I realized that, therefore I, I add the MDT. Yeah, good. Uh, so yeah, because we, because we are giving the feedback, uh, I'll also add a couple of points. One, regarding the uh, urodynamic tracing, um, uh, uh, 
the period curve that was like the sawtooth pattern not even not the classic one but still because of the emg tracing uh, which shows activity uh, this is a bit of classical of uh, detrusor external sinter designers yeah so that was the um, answer that was looking for and also you are right that there is a detrusor over activity as well so this is a classic picture where uh, the uh, infrapondine and suprasacral lesion having this uh, detrusor over activity as well as the dsd so uh, in this one uh, the, your approach is right to start with uh, anticholinergics mirror background uh, we don't have any evidence to give mirror background in a neurogenic bladder um, but uh, uh, there are there are studies which says that it has it, it improves the uh, quality of life and the uh, bladder dynamics the other one is um, to uh, to approach this one is to approach the bladder and approach the outlet so the one that you started is the approaching the bladder and the other one we can give is the approaching the outlet with the outlet management procedures uh, for uh, and i have given a slide where uh, we can uh, you, you can follow a pattern where you can describe the urodynamics so it's just like uh, mr danishagran says about ct scan so as as it is shown you can start explaining uh, with that pattern uh, that's given in the slides uh, moving forward uh, the embark study is for the oab uh, botox in oab for uh, neurogenic bladder uh, it is the dignity studies and also uh, for neurogenic bladder it is advisable to start straight away with 200 international units and um, the eiu guideline says that uh, it is 200 international units over 30 sites but it can vary with the surgeons i do accept that but for exam purposes uh, based on the dignity studies crossitar um, then it, it is 200 units uh, and yeah and uh, as mr dan sharan said sacral neuromodulation we still don't have much evidence in uh, new neuro, neuro neuropaths so uh, shall we go to the next one then yes please so, uh, but in the exam it is like straight like when when you finish one it will go straight away to the next scenario <coughs> in this one um i'll set the timer Yeah. So you have a 48 year old woman referred by the GP for complaints of urinary incontinence. How are you going to evaluate her? So I reviewed this patient in my dedicated uh, female urology clinic uh, with the continence nurse. Uh, I will assess the history regarding the onset and duration of the incontinence. Um, I will ask about whether uh, the trigger for the incontinence, whether it is a uh, stress incontinence or mixed one. Um, I will ask also about the frequency and uh, severity of the incontinence, the impact in her social and sexual life. I will ask about any associated uh, avoiding symptoms, exclude any red flag symptoms like uh, hematuria, recurrent UTI or palpable masses. Um, I will ask also about uh, any constipation, uh, about whether the patient is uh, postmenopausal or not. Uh, I will ask about any obvious, um, uh, <coughs> sorry, about any neurological disease or past uh, medical problem, the use of any medication which may make, make her incontinence worse, like um, diuretic or alpha blocker. And uh, uh, ask about any previous surgery, any surgery or radiotherapy uh, for the pelvis, about her previous gynecological history, any child uh, birth, the use of uh, assisted uh, device during delivery, um, also about um, smoking uh, um, uh, as well. Uh, and then I will proceed to examination of the patient. I will examine the patient uh, BMI. Uh, and then uh, examine the patient in the supine and left lateral uh, position. Uh, I will, in the abdominal examination, I look for uh, any palpable uh, bladder, and then I will uh, inspect the uh, genitalia, and I will examine the patient, the presence of chaperone with the patient consent. So I will uh, look uh, at the perineum, uh, looking for any obvious abnormality. 
I look for the estrogenization of the female genitalia, urethral diverticulum, uh, any uh, prolapse, uh, urethral uh, carankle. I'll ask a patient to cough to see if there is any urine leak. <coughs> Sorry. Mm-hmm. Take it down. And um, then after that, I will um, examine the patient uh, looking to assess uh, the uh, vaginal uh, tone. And uh, I complete my examination by uh, same uh, speculum um, as well. Uh, and then I'll ask a patient to do a urine stick. Uh, I will uh, ask a patient to uh, do a post-void uh, bladder residue, post-void bladder ultrasound. I'll give the patient uh, a three-day bladder diary to fill in and also the uh, ICIQ urinary incontinence uh, short form um, to fill in. Okay. Uh, can you tell me more about ICIQ UISF? Uh, the ICIQ um, urinary incontinence short form, usually it asks about the symptom for the last four weeks and mainly it contains uh, four questions which ask about uh, the uh, frequency of urinary incontinence, the severity of urinary incontinence, uh, the bother score and the trigger for the incontinence. Okay. Uh, what other investigations would you need in this lady? So usually, if, if there is no complicating factors uh, like uh, hematuria, um, significant voiding urinary symptoms, recurrent UTI, if it is just a pure uh, citrus urinary incontinence, usually we don't do uh, much investigation. Okay, well done. And uh, what is the uh, definition of stress urinary incontinence? It is, uh, it's a uh, uh, involuntary leakage of urine, which is uh, triggered by uh, increasing intraabdominal pressure, like coughing, uh, sneezing, or doing some physical activity. Uh, what's the classification of stress urinary incontinence? So the classification, according to Balivas uh, video urodynamic classification, it divides into three types. Um, type one, when there is a descent of the uh, uh, bladder base uh, less than two centimeter below the lower margin of the symphysis pubis uh, during citrus uh, class two or type two when there is a, a descent of the bladder base more than two centimeter below the lower border of the symphysis pubis uh, type two a this will happen only during citrus while type two b it will be there all the time and type three when the uh, bladder neck uh, uh, and urethra are widely open at rest, which uh, signif- usually type 1 and type 2 suggest urethral hypermobility, while uh, type 3 suggestive of intrinsic sphincter deficiency. Okay, so why, how are you going to manage this patient? So for this patient, I will start with the uh, conservative measure and lifestyle advice. So I'll ask, advise the patient to uh, reduce weight if she is obese, uh, stop smoking, treat any constipation, modify her medication if she is taking any medication which may affect continence. Uh, I will ask her to do pelvic floor exercise, uh, which is, uh, I will explain that these are short, sharp pull-up. The patient need to do it at least eight to 10 times, three times uh, daily. I will give her the pass leaflet for pelvic floor exercise and it is uh, advised that um, the uh, exercise should be supervised by a physiotherapist and augmented by uh, biofeedback and it should be done for at least three months to be uh, effective. Uh, I will also support the patient with some uh, continence appliance. So this is my initial um, approach and then I will review her again in three months time. Okay. Uh, are there any medications that you can use for stress urinary incontinence? Yes, I am aware of the use of uh, duloxetine. However, it is uh, not uh, recommended as initial treatment by NAS guideline. Uh, if the patient is not responding to conservative therapy, then the next step should be um, surgical treatment. But if the patient uh, is not keen to consider surgery or she is not fit for surgery, then I'll uh, advise about the use of duloxetine. Uh, what's the mechanism of action of duloxetine? Duloxetine is a combined uh, uh, noradrenaline and serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Okay. Uh, 
Um, for... uh, sorry, by, by this, it, uh, it actually merely it will um, stimulate uh, increase the tone of the pudendal nerve, and by this it will increase the tone in the uh, external sphincter. Okay, well, uh, if she doesn't improve with uh, non-surgical management, uh, what is your next option? Then the patient need to go for um, surgical option for treatment of stress urinary incontinence. Uh, this should be done through uh, uh, pelvic uh, MDT. And the option available for the patient is urethral bulking agent injection. Uh, uh, the sorry, urethral bulking agent injection. The use of a telogos pubovaginal sling, facial sling, and also colpo suspension. Okay, tell me more about the periurethral bulking injection, please. So the urethral bulking agent injection, it, the idea is that it will create a bulk in the urethra on the area of the sphincter, so it will create like a mucosal um, co-optation. Um, we have many um, material used for the injection. I am aware of the use of um, silicone, which is macroplastic, and also the use of bulkamide, which is uh, polyacrylamide uh, hydrogel. Mm -hmm. Usually the injection is given either under local anesthesia with a special appliance mm -hmm. or with a uh, rigid uh, cystoscopy mm -hmm. <coughs> under general anesthesia. Mm -hmm. um, and usually I need to inform the patient that uh, this injection is, the material is permanent. Mm -hmm. <coughs> However, it may wear off after time. Mm -hmm. The patient may need to have a repeat injection. Mm -hmm. I will inform the patient about the possible complication, which include urinary tract infection, hematuria in 5% of the patient, urinary retention in about 10% of the patient, de novo urgency in about 10 to 15% of the uh, patient, and uh, also about the low possibility of migration of the uh, uh, implant or uh, the bulking agent or extrusion into the bladder, which usually happen more with the macroplastic rather than the bulk emit. Okay. Uh, what about the uh, synthetic mediurethral tapes. Are we doing it now? Uh, no, there, there is because of um, uh, concern uh, about uh, the problem with the uh, permanent uh, mesh implant. Um, all the TVT, TOTs and other mesh procedure have uh, put on hold in the UK. And there are certain uh, criteria for very limited center who are doing this procedure at the moment. Okay. Uh, what are the other options for her uh, if the mesh and uh, the, the, oh sorry it's time now so we'll stop there uh, how, how, how was it for you yeah thank you Great. sorry uh, 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 I mean uh, 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 the second session I think it went well isn't it yeah the yeah. first one yeah. I was not expecting the session yeah. but it is good to do I it very well see. Ahmed, thank you. The, the, the only thing is there is a small possibility a question may come because it's quite relevant to the present scenarios where uh, what is the national guidelines for people who had mesh placement in the past. So you may have to say that uh, mesh removal, especially for patients with symptomatic erosion, is a very difficult procedure. And also, we need to remove the mesh in total, not just the removal of the small segment next to the urethra is going to give a good recovery. And uh, so, nationally, a few handful of centers were selected and uh, the functional urology specialists were trained as a tertiary referral center. That is something happened over the past few years to tackle this mesh-related complications. And since there is a pooling of patients and tertiary referral, the expertise of the specific people also was quite good and the mesh removal surgery standards were nicely maintained. In fact, that is one of the BOW's uh, main job to make sure that it is nicely available and nicely spread out all over the UK so that people don't have to travel a long distance. A question may come in that place. And subsequently, mm -hmm. the next question is, uh, what is the present uh, view? And you can say like tensor facial data or rectus fascia, autologous links are in place and slightly even though it's not for the same population corpus suspension also is getting into play now and we are looking at more of uh, uh, natural uh, uh, autologous uh, sources for the surgeries 
but having said that still tvt tot is possible in selecting people who understand the concerns and accepted by the euro oncology entity so that is the final step yeah yeah exactly yeah. Uh, it went well uh, and uh, i'll give a couple of uh, feedbacks uh, one thing is that uh, i have put all the slides for this session and uh, the, the neuro uh, for this one uh, i would suggest to bring the patient decision making aid so there are patient decision making aids for yeah. then there's a nice pdas and bows pdas for stress urinary incontinence so you can give either of these and also for patients with a mesh complication uh, there is a pda for that one as well yeah and uh, it is it is nice to bring the keywords the uh, especially when the question on mesh is asked uh, the cumberledge report and also the first do no harm report published in july 2020 uh, and then uh, you said about the mdt but uh, it, it is again the minimal inv- uh, invasive things like botox you need a local mdt but for the uh, other things for the uh, sorry not for the sui so f- there are two types of mdts as recommended in the sui one is a local mdt and there is the regional mdt for for in, and there are specific criteria so you don't have to go through all those uh, things during the exam but still it, it is better to be aware of the role of local mdt and the regional mdt yeah yeah so what's the first report on the mesh uh, so that is a cumberledge report uh, mm. which address the mesh complications vag- okay. vaginal mesh complications uh, i have put it in the slides right yeah thank you very much and uh, this scenario went really well and also uh, uh, mo- mo- sometimes what happens is uh, in exams the scenario can start really from the uh, um, failure of mesh or failure of previous procedures in which case most of the discussion will be on artificial urinary sphincters and there is a, a systematic review in a, a stress urinary incontinence it is called as a ester study which compared uh, nine surgical interventions and um, they come up with some evidence that the retropubic mid-urethral sling is the most cost effective long term so uh, i have put that slide as well in the, in the in the review so uh, i would suggest to uh, go through this video uh, through the slides and uh, one thing is that uh, again going back uh, for the urodynamics if you have a pattern to explain the urodynamics it will take only like 30 seconds which will give us a lot of time to answer the further questions but you and you reach the end of the scenario so no concerns on that but thank you very much uh, and yeah i think uh, yeah I, i hope this was helpful this was uh, the neurogenic bladder uh, yeah it's a, it's a bit of uh, difficult scenario that's why i thought i'll uh, put all the slides for the review and it is it it it, it will always be better if you can review the, uh, go through the slides the day before so it will be really fresh yeah thank you very much thanks uh if there is nothing else then we can stop this session is all right okay guys so well done and um, th- these two scenarios are very important and there are some references to code and there is nothing much changed except for few things in the tape removal part uh, tape is contraindicated is now well established in the first exams we are talking that for 4 5 years but tape removal guidelines is relatively new for the past 2 uh, years mm-hmm. well done we'll see in another scenario within this weekend okay. yeah thank okay. you very much Thanks thank so you much. for your as well thank you bye thank you bye, bye.